Hi, I'm Jason Price, the director of Teresio, and I'm here with Pavlo Beznosiuk, who is the leader of the Academy of Ancient Music. We have today uh, four bows um, to give us a little bit of a taste of what's to come. The first um, is basically an illustration of what we're starting from. This is a clip-in style bow, a reproduction, but some, a style that would have been uh, in use uh, in the um, late 17th century and before. Now, from this, over the next hundred years, we make a transition into what we know of the modern bow, which looks nothing like that. Um, the modern bow has uh, a head of equal height to the frog, it's got metal for the ferrule, it's got uh, a camber which is concave, and it has undergone a rather complete uh, revolution uh, over these hundred years. Now we're going to be looking today at three bows. The first is by Nicolas Pierre Tourte, the founder of the Tourte family and the first bow maker of that family. The second is by his first son named Nicolas Leonard, uh, which is already a little bit more um, evolved and developed. Uh, and the third is by John Dodd, which was an English maker um, contemporary of uh, these uh, of the Tourte family. Now, what's really fascinating about this period is that there is a tremendous variation that is happening. Uh, you get bows which are long, you get bows which are short, you get bows which have a high head and bows which have a low head, and you have an incredible variety of, of output which leads to an incredible variety of possibilities for playing. Pablo, where do we start? Well, we start with the, with the earliest uh, bow, I suppose, here, this uh, um, uh, taut here, which I would describe as a a high Baroque uh, bow, you say 1750, 1750 60. 1750, 60. So, yeah, this, this functions just as, as uh, a, a very well developed uh, Baroque bow. A musical aesthetic at this time was as much to do with uh, the human voice and, and a rhetor a rhetorical gesture um, as it was to do with sound. Mere, you know, th this this bow is not a mere producer of sound. It's uh, what I would describe as a speaking stick, uh -huh. um, and it certainly okay. does speak. I mean, if we take the opening of uh, Tartini, those. Um, you know, it, it sort of mirrors the, uh, the, the nuances of speech. Um, you know, we don't, we don't speak in one monotone like, like, mm -hmm. like, like that. And uh, yet the, the tendency over, um, over the centuries in the, in the develop, development of the, of the bow is, I have to say, towards something which is much more... Mm, um, longer lines. Longer lines and, and, and much more sustained. Mm. I mean, this is a very sophisticated bow. It's really gorgeous. Love the way it, it hugs the string. Mm -hmm. So this this bow you'll notice has a um, a frog which is substantially higher than the tip, and this creates um, it creates a certain advantage in the down bow over the up bow, or a certain different flavor in each. When you make the transition to some of the more advanced bows or some of the later bows of the 18th century, you start to have as a rule a head which is of the same height as the frog. Yes, and, and the, that allows uh, concomitant, well, longer lines for a for a oh, The tendency of that sound yeah. to actually really sustain out in a, in a really nice way. You don't have to sort of work against the, the, the weakness in, in, the, in the point area of that. So now you've you've got available for you something for ex example from the uh, Haydn C major and uh, what I love about that is that you've got the uh, sort of operatic possibilities for the, uh, the for the long line, but you've also got this sort of you've got everything you've got, uh -huh. <laughs> you've got the the possibilities for for uh, nuance and fast nuance as well. <laughs> 
that. You know, that so you, and you had that articulation at the tip, which possibly wouldn't have been. Uh, it wouldn't have been as easy. As easy. If, if you worked hard, you could get it out mm. of that. But the the point is, uh, it's we're, we're getting towards the uh, the supermarket approach in a bow where you can just about do uh, uh, anything. There are so many technical uh, innovations going on in a bow like this. Um, this frog still looks very ornamented and very baroque, awesome. but it's very actually pretty. very uh, modern in its concept. Um, uh, Nicholas Leonard Twert was trying to find a way to stabilize the uh, frog on the stick so that it would not wobble, because there's enough wobble in a bow without a, uh, without a feral to Absolutely. fix the hair in yeah. place. And Nicholas Leonard Twert, among others, um, used this I innovation of having a flat plinth upon which the frog travels, uh, and it creates a much more solid base that, you've, um, that, that, that you give yourself down on, mm -hmm. the, on the lower end of the, of the stick. Um, you also have this wonderful um, and very delicate uh, trailing edge of, the, um, of the, the head here, which allows the, the hair to form itself a little bit more um, uh, solidly into a, into a flat ribbon. Uh, and uh, although it was, it was discontinued when the, when the head became fully mature into what we think of as the, the modern bow today, it was a step along the way towards making it more uh, solid. Then finally, um, this bow, which is probably in head at least, it's closest to what we call the Viotti bow, the modern, um, mm. the modern bow. Um, we still have a, we, we still have a, an 18th century concept of, of frog, and um, it's still quite a bit shorter than the modern bow would be. Um, but it allows all of a sudden a new, what, strength of playing, warmth well, of playing? Well, I say def and definitely strength. I mean, it's uh, just... In Here's the nick and nick and nick. Wow. Straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Big this difference. is incredibly re re uh, refined and gorgeous. It will still carry. But bows like this, the way they give you the possibilities for uh, uh, dramatic, prof mm -hmm. profound playing mm -hmm. uh, in, in slow movements. Think of uh, Beethoven. <laughs> Uh, uh, that the bow <laughs> that helps uh, yeah. a, a great deal. Good, good step. Yeah. This is really just a sampling of what you're going to discuss and what's going to be um, uh, available to see during this mm -hmm. exhibition. Um, one of the things that I hope we are able to do with this is bring together the bow making community with the period playing community and I hope we can learn something from each other. Pavlo's workshop on the 27th kicks off a week of master classes and roundtables and lectures. Uh, on Saturday, uh, there's a roundtable with Jean-Francois Raffin, Jerome Coca, Christophe Quan, Bernard Milant, and several others. Um, Christophe Quan will also be leading a master class that day. Um, and the exhibition is from the 1st through the 3rd of November, and we hope you can make it. <laughs>